All Cars, the copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Calling all cars. Attention all cars. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Broadcast 140. Be on the lookout for man described as short, wearing dark suit, checked cap, wanted for murder. This subject is armed. Bring him in, boys. That is all. How long have you been listening to Calling All Cars? We met one man last week who had heard every broadcast for two years and nine months, and he confessed he had never yet tried Rio Grande cracked gasoline. We had to congratulate him on his sales resistance, but we sympathized with him for all he's been missing. Those of you who are now regular users of Rio Grande cracked will remember how skeptical you were when you first tried this gasoline. You were convinced that all gasolines were pretty much alike and you didn't see how Rio Grande cracked could be any different. Well, we convinced you, didn't we? It only takes about 10 gallons to prove to the driver of an old car or a new one that this gasoline gets more out of your engine. We know it's our exclusive patented cracking process that makes the difference. But all you care about is that when Rio Grande cracked gasoline reaches your engine, it quiets right down. That throbbing vibration stops. Your motor runs smoother because cracked gasoline is scientifically balanced to burn evenly without wasting any power. Every atom is turned into power. No wonder your car speeds up. There is no waste as in ordinary uncracked gasolines. Rio Grande's scientific cracking process ensures that you get all the mileage possible out of every gallon. And we hope you'll keep a record to prove to yourself how much more economical it is. We have no fear that Rio Grande cracked gasoline will fail to pass any test of power, speed, or economy. For it has been tested by the leading cities and counties of the West, with the result that it is now specified to power more police, fire, and emergency cars than any other brand wherever it is sold. Will you follow the recommendation of these many cities and counties and start using Rio Grande cracked gasoline tomorrow? Now it is our pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. A very safe rule to apply in life is the rule of suspicion. The proof of this observation will be found in the case you are about to hear. If the vagrant, Culver, had been sufficiently suspicious of the kindnesses of his casual acquaintance, Sam, we might not have had a murder case to solve. Unfortunately, you pay for everything you get. Whenever someone starts showering attentions and presents on you, you may be sure that you are expected to recompense them in some way. Our files are full of cases which started just as this one, with a chance meeting in Pershing Square or a conversation begun in a dairy lunch and ended up in murder. I've had such a lovely time tonight. Have you, Ethel? Why, it was just like before we were married. Dinner at the Coconut Grove, and you treating me like you weren't my husband at all. I'm glad you enjoyed yourself, Ethel. Well, now for a good night's sleep after our evening of mild debauchery. Uh, Yes, I must admit I'm mighty tired. Switch on the light, will you, Sam? There you are. All right, folks, just be quiet and you won't get hurt. Uh, well, what is this? Hold up. Oh, Sam, give him your money. Well, I, I haven't got much, but I'll, I'll give you all what I have. All right, folks, all right. Keep clear, please. Hold them back, guys. Sure, get back now, folks. You'll have to get back. You too, mister. I live here. This is my apartment, and this this was my wife. Oh, I see. You come on in here with me, mister. All right, let's go. Now, how did it happen? My wife and I had been to the coconut grove. We had just come into the room and turned on the light, for the man stepped out of the cupboard there and held us up. I, I told him I didn't have much money, but I'd give him what I had. 
And suddenly he started shooting at my wife. I pulled out my gun and emptied it at him, and he ran away. My wife was dead by the time I got her up on the bed. I see. Did you recognize this burglar? No. He had a bandana over his face. Oh, Fan. Here's a man who saw the murderer escape. Yeah? Bring him in. Right. Come in, please, Mr. Thaler. Yes. Tell Lieutenant Brown what you just told me. Well, sir, I, uh, I heard the shooting as I was coming upstairs. And just as I got to the head of the stairs, a man ran down the hall and took those steps up to the roof two at a time. Up to the roof, eh? Yeah. Well, we better take a look up there, guys. Must be still up there. Well, you can get from this roof to the roof of the hotel next door. Say, maybe you escaped that way. We'll make sure of that. Sergeant. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Tell the boys down the street not to let anybody out of this building or the one next door. Yes, sir. And don't let anybody into this room until Lieutenant Geis and I get back. Yes, sir. These are the stairs down the hall, Mr. Taylor? Yes, those are the ones. They lead to the roof. Come on, guys. All right. dark up here. Flash your light around. Not much place for anybody to hide. There's the stairway into the building next door. Let's take a look over there. Uh Uh-oh. Look here, Thad. What? On the roof, a trail of blood. This will be a cinch. Yep. It goes down these stairs. Turns to the right here. Stops at that door. Come on. Come on. Open up. You guessed it, buddy. I figured you'd be here. What's it all about? That's what I want to know. That's what we want to know, too. You're pretty badly shot up, aren't you? Sort of. How did it happen? Well, I went up on the roof a little while ago for a breath of air, and a guy comes running out of the penthouse next door, runs past me, and takes a shot at me. Runs down the stairs through this building... That's all I know about it. Why didn't you report this to the police? It only happened a few minutes ago. I've been in too much pain to do anything. I better get you to the hospital right away. Guys, you go back next door and bring Mr. Thaler and Mr. Whitaker down to Georgia Street. I want them to have a look at this bird. Well, Doctor, what's the verdict? I removed this slug from beneath his collarbone. Uh, 3220. Uh huh. Anything else? Yes, another bullet passed through his right arm, and a third pinked the flesh on his chest. Oh, so he's been shot three times, eh? Apparently. I want a couple of people to see him. Is it all right to go in? Well, he'll be ready in just a minute. Good. I'll call them in. Come on in, gentlemen. You got Mr. Whitaker's gun, Geese? Yes, here it is. Mm, 3220. Well, Mr. Whitaker, your shots took effect on our suspect. Here's a slug they just dug out of his neck. Sorry it wasn't in his heart. I don't see how I failed to kill him. It was point blank. In the habit of carrying a gun, Mr. Whitaker? Uh, Oh, no. I just recently got this one. I'm glad I did now. The suspect in here says his name is Jack Lane. Do you know anybody by that name, Mr. Whitaker? No. Do you know anybody who might have wanted to rob you? No. Was this fellow you saw running out of Mr. Whitaker's apartment familiar to you, Mr. Thaler? No, I never saw him before. You can come in now, Lieutenant. Thanks, Doctor. Come with me, Mr. Failer. Look closely at this fellow, Mr. Failer. Is he the one you saw coming out of Whitaker's apartment? Yeah. Yes, he is. Oh, you're crazy, mister. Are you positive? Absolutely. All right. Would you mind asking Mr. Whitaker to come in? Why, sir. Come in, Mr. Whitaker. I want you to have a look at this young man. Is he the one who held you up and shot your wife? No. Are you positive? Yes, positive. But Mr. Failer has just identified him as the man who ran from your apartment. I don't care what Mr. Failer has said. I saw the murder in bright light. I'd know him again. This isn't the man. See? What did I tell you? Now let me go to sleep, will you? Okay, Jimmy. Go to sleep. Now, if you don't want me any longer, Lieutenant, I think I'll grab a cab. I'll have to ask you not to go back to your apartment until we've completed our investigations there. I don't intend to. I should stay at the sanitarium of a doctor friend of mine in Alhambra. You better leave me the address. Why? Well, naturally, you'll have to testify. Testify? Where? What? At the inquest. Oh, Lieutenant, isn't there any way to get out of that? I'm not a well man. I've been under the doctor's care for some time now, and this thing has me so upset. I, I really Sorry, Mr. Whitaker, you'll have to testify. Now, what is your address in Alhambra? Well, it's Dr. Merrill's place. 
on Downey Drive. Very well, Mr. Whitaker. We'll get in touch with you when we need you. Uh, good night. Good night, Lieutenant Brown. Good night, Lieutenant Guy. Good night. Good night. There's something funny here, guys. What? Failure identifies this boy in there as the one who ran out of the Whitaker apartment, and Mr. Whitaker claims he isn't the man. There's something funny about the boy, too. What's that? Look at this card I found in his pocket. Cheap to pay. What of it? Look on the other side. Where it's written in pencil? Yeah. Jimmy Culver reports to work at 8 p.m. Signed, Pete. The kid's lying about his name. I guess we better have a talk with him. Come on. Oh, what do you guys want now? Now, listen, Jimmy. All we want is for you to come clean with us. I have come clean with you. What are you talking about? You told us your name was Lane. Well, it is. How do you explain this card? I... I never saw it before. I found it in your coat pocket. Oh, please go away and let me get some rest. Sure, we'll be glad to when you tell us the truth. Okay, then. Culver's my right name. Jimmy Culver. Then why did you give us a phony? I don't know. I... Gosh, a guy's liable to do anything when he's gone through what I have. Being shot at and all. Early the next morning, Lieutenant Brown and Geist visit the crime investigation laboratory. Query police chemist, Ray Pinker. Well, Ray, have you gone through the Whitaker evidence yet? Yes, Fab. I've got some findings that will interest you. Let's have it. Mr. Whitaker was armed with a 3220, wasn't he? Right. Now, Culver apparently was armed with a 3080. How do you know that? Well, we found two types of slugs on the scene, 38s and 32. Look at this 38 slug under the microscope. You notice black threads and blue threads caught in the lead? Yeah. yeah let's, let's have a look, guys. Now, look at this slug here. Notice it has blue threads and black threads on it. Yeah, so it has. And here's still another slug with threads on it. And look under the microscope. It looks as though it were studded with diamonds. What's that from? That's the slug that went through the looking glass. Say, Pinker, these three slugs aren't all the same size. That's just the point. According to the autopsy, Mrs. Whitaker was shot three times. These are the three bullets. Two of them came from Culver's 38, and the third from Whitaker's 32. What? You mean? I mean that Mr. Whitaker shot one of the bullets that killed his wife. Without revealing to Mr. Whitaker the extent of their investigation, Brown and Guy, accompanied by Agnes Underwood, a newspaper woman, bring Whitaker once more face to face with Culver in the General Hospital. But Whitaker is still not positive. Well, the eyes and forehead look something like the man who did the shooting, but I, I can't be sure. I can't be sure of anything. I, I'm too upset about this whole thing. Of course, we understand, but take your time. Look at him carefully. You don't mind, do you, Jimmy? Oh, no. Not me. I'm having a swell time. Go on. Keep looking at me like I was a damn stuffed owl. Go ahead. Fad. Yes, Agnes? Come on outside a minute. I want to tell you something. Okay. What is it, Agnes? There's something between those two men. What do you mean? When we walked into that room a few minutes ago, I saw Whitaker deliberately wink at that boy. Are you sure? I'm positive. Mm. That ties up with what we've already found. I think you ought to place him under arrest. No, not yet. You'll have him followed while we work on Culver. He's the weak sister. You'll break first. Well, I suppose you know what's there. Yeah, and thanks for tipping me off to that, Agnes. I got a couple of angles on this case, and when they're ready, well, I'll break them to you first. <laughs> You're a darling, Ted. You mind if I use this winking business in my story right away? No, oh, go ahead. Well, I got to run then. Goodbye. Goodbye, Agnes. Thanks again. I can't be sure. Not getting anywhere, eh? No, Mr. Whitaker can't be sure this is the man. Of course he can't, because I ain't. I was shot at up on the roof, I tell you. Okay, Jimmy, take it easy. Well, Mr. Whitaker, it's too bad you can't be positive in your identification. I'm terribly sorry. I'd give anything to be able to help you, but I can't. Well, that's that. I don't think there's anything further we need of you. And I'll be getting along. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Whitaker. Oh, uh, by the way, have they found the gun that killed my wife? Not yet. We've hunted all over the hotel, but we haven't seen it. I'd give 10000 if that gun could be found and the murderer hanged for his crime. Good night. $10,000. That's offering a pretty big reward. He probably doesn't have it. Follow him, guys. He knows a lot more than he's telling. I don't want to take any chance on him skipping out on us. Okay, where will you be? I want to have a little talk with Jimmy here. I'll see you later. Ain't you had enough talks with me? No. I'm going to keep on having talks with you until you tell me the truth about this. I've told you the truth. No, you haven't, Jimmy. What, are you sucking for that $10,000 reward he said he'd give? That doesn't concern me. 
I've got a suspicion that he's as guilty of this murder as you are. Huh? Where'd you hide that thirty-eight, Jimmy? Uh, what did he wink at you for when he came in here tonight? Jimmy, Mrs. Whitaker was killed by three bullets. Two of them came from your thirty-eight. The third came from Whitaker's thirty-two. He killed his wife and he tried to kill you, Jimmy. What do you think you can gain by protecting a rat like that? I've been shot at enough. But not by a stranger on the roof. Was that really his wife that was bumped off? Yes. There's something wrong somewhere. What do you mean? I've been double-crossed. I'm not a rat. Oh, of course you're not a rat, Jimmy. So that dame was his wife. So tell me this, Brown. How long has that guy lived in Los Angeles? About 30 years. About 30? That dirty liar. All right, Cover. Now it's plain you've got something on your mind. Come on, let's have it. That guy told me he was a gangster. A gangster? He's no more a gangster than I am. He told me that he wanted to get that dame bumped off because she was a mall from back east and she'd squealed on baby-faced Nelson. He said he was connected in Chicago with some big shots. And you fell for that. Well, how was I to know? It sounded on the level. How much did he promise you for the job? Fifty bucks and an airplane ticket to Chicago. He said he'd fix me up there. Where did you first run into Whitaker? Owned him by the price of coffee and... When? Sometime in January. We got to be friendly. He staked me to groom rent and some new clothes. He sent me out to buy a gun for him. Did you? Yeah. Is that the gun he turned over to us? No. He bought that one from the doorman of a nightclub. Where's the gun you bought? I hid it after the shooting the other night. Where? He, he told me to put it in a mattress up on the roof of the hotel. He cut a hole in it. Now, what happened the other night? Well, he, he told me he'd bring this woman to the hotel about 12.30. For me to be in the room. He left the door unlocked for me. And did you go there? Yeah. Yeah, I was there all right. What happened? Well, they came in, turned on the lights, and I stepped out and told them to hand over their dough. The woman was excited, but Whitaker didn't say much. Finally, he said, I haven't much on me, but you can have what I got. That was a signal. Signal for what? For me to start shooting. I did. I had the gun right on her heart. But then as soon as I started to shoot at her, he started shooting at me. That's what I can't understand. I think I'm beginning to understand. Only he made the mistake of putting a bullet into her for good measure. Brown goes back to the hotel and finds the gun hidden in the mattress, exactly as Culver had described. Then, accompanied by R.B. Steed, night captain of the homicide squad, he drives out to the sanitarium in Alhambra, where the officers route Mr. Whittaker out of bed. Sorry to wake you in the middle of the night, Mr. Whittaker. Oh, that's all right. I haven't been able to sleep much since this terrible thing happened. This is Captain Steed, Mr. Whittaker. How do you do? Glad to know you, Mr. Whittaker. There's some details we've got to clear up before the inquest tomorrow morning. Well, I'll be glad to help all I can. I've been in a terrible day since the other night, but my memory is slowly coming back to me now. That's fine. Now, in the first place, Mr. Whittaker, how do you account for the fact that the man who did the shooting knew where you lived and at what time you'd be out of the room? I haven't the faintest idea. And as far as that's concerned, the place wasn't ransacked. I I didn't even it didn't even look like a robbery. Mr. Whittaker, have you ever made chance acquaintances, given people you met on the street money? Yes, that's a great fault of mine, really. I'm uh, much too free with my money. Do you remember the names of any of the people you've given money to? Well, there was Tony. I don't know his last name. Davy James. And uh, there was a fellow named Andrews or Anderson. You know, as a matter of fact, I've got a feeling this fellow in jail is that Anderson. Wouldn't you have recognized him already? I have a very poor memory for faces. When did you come to this conclusion? When I left the hospital this afternoon. I've been thinking about him, and I'm sure he's the same fellow. Hmm. Do you recognize him as the man who was in your apartment that well, night? Uh, I can't be positive about that. He, he might have been. There's no question about it, Mr. Whitaker. He was. Your wife carry any insurance, Mr. Whitaker? Uh, what's that? Insurance. Does your wife carry any? Yes, I believe she did. How much? Well, it seems to me she had one policy for $4,000 and another for $5,000. Yeah. That would be $18,000 of double indemnity for accidental death. Uh, what's that? Oh, nothing. Just thinking out loud. Mr. Whitaker... I'm afraid we'll have to ask you to get your clothes on and come over to the scene of the crime with us. We want to check up some things. Uh, 
half hour later, Mr. Whittaker, accompanied by the officers, enters his apartment for the first time since the murder of his wife. Now, Mr. Whittaker, we'd like to have you show us exactly what position you, your wife, and the murderer were in at the time of the shooting. Now, suppose Lieutenant Brown is your wife. Where was she standing? Right over there by the bed. Take that position, will you, Thad? Right. Now, I'll take the position where you were standing. Where was that? Right there, about two feet from where you are now. Very well. Now, you take the position of the gunman. He, he stood right over here. You're sure of that? I'm positive. That would be impossible, Mr. Whitaker. Well, I know what I'm talking about. Perhaps you do. And you're not telling us the truth. Why, what do you mean? Look at the bullet holes in the wall there. There was another bullet sent into that mattress. And another bullet broke the looking glass. None of those bullets could have been fired into the body of your wife from the position you say the bandit took, or for that matter, from the position you took. Uh, what do you mean by that? Look for yourself. You see, it's impossible the way you describe it. Say, wait a minute. I think I can find that gun for you. Hmm? Where is it? Hey, follow me. You see, my wife used to take sun baths on an old mattress up here on the roof. She might have hidden the gun there. That's funny. It's been moved. Well, maybe it's over here on the other room. That chump is certainly walking right into it, Captain. Never thought to fail. Give him enough rope. Yes, here it is, over here. Yeah, there's been so many officers up here looking around, it probably wouldn't be under here. Yes, but maybe it's in this slit. I don't think you'll find it there, Mr. Whitaker. No, I guess I'm wrong. It doesn't seem to be here. It isn't, because it's in my pocket. I took it out of that slit three hours ago. What? What made you think it was here? Well, it occurred to me it would be a good place to hide it. You mean this is the place you arranged for Culver to hide it? I don't know what you mean. Culver's confessed the whole thing, Mr. Whittaker. We know all about how you employed him to bump off your wife. That's a lie. Why, he must be out of his mind. I, I never did such a thing. He must be crazy, or you're crazy. I don't know. I I'm all confused. Maybe I didn't hear you right. Oh, this thing has been so terrible... You didn't say just now that I tried to have my wife murdered. No, no, I, I guess I'm dazed again. Nobody could accuse me of such a thing. Me who, who loved her like a child. All right, Mr. Whitaker. That act's no longer any good. You'll have to come along with us. On the next day at the coroner's inquest, Culver testifies... Yeah, this guy Whitaker propositioned me to kill a woman. I agreed to do it for $50 and a trip to Chicago. I didn't know it was his wife he wanted bumped. If I had, I wouldn't have done it. I was willing to do it because he told me she was a stoolie. Whitaker, having heard the testimony, changes his story somewhat when he takes the stand. Yes, I knew this man, Culver, by the name of Henry Anderson. I befriended him out of the goodness of my heart. I gave him money for food and for room rent. This is the way he repays me, by murdering my wife, by framing me. It's enough to shake your faith in human nature. In the opinion of this coroner's jury, Mrs. Ethel Whitaker met her death by felonious homicide committed by James Culver or Samuel Whitaker or both. This jury recommends that they be held to answer to a charge of murder. In spite of Whitaker's loud protestations of innocence, he is held to answer. While he remains in the Los Angeles County Jail awaiting trial, the officers continue their tireless investigation into his past. They uncover some strange things which are brought out in the trial, produce surprise witnesses. Among them... I am the dead woman's sister... My father left my sister and me $6,000. Sam Whitaker ran through it in less than a year. And then he kept my sister and me working and supporting him. My name is John Stokes. I live in Dodge City, Kansas. Samuel Whitaker made love to my sister Ella while she was in California. She believed he meant to marry her. She turned her money over to him. When she discovered he was already married, she committed suicide. Mrs. Whitaker was struck by three bullets, any one of which could have caused death. Two of these bullets were shot from the gun admittedly belonging to Culver. The third bullet was fired from the gun Mr. Whitaker admitted only. There must not be any doubt. 
doubt in the clear, sane minds of you 12 good and true citizens that the crime of murder has been here brutally committed. There is but one way you can act. There is but one decision you can make in determining the fate of this man who hired a man to murder his wife and then sought to murder the murderer in order to clear his name and receive the $18,000 of insurance money. A man so low that he double-crossed himself, so unable to depend upon his hiring that he sent one of his own bullets crashing through his wife's body. Gentlemen and ladies of the jury, you we must find the defendant, find the Samuel Whitaker, guilty of murder in the first degree and recommend life imprisonment. An unfortunate holdout among the jurors saved Samuel Whitaker from hanging for his crime. He was also found guilty of assault with a deadly weapon with intent to commit murder on the person of James Culver and received a concurrent sentence of from one to ten years for that. Culver, his weak-willed accomplice, was allowed to plead guilty of second-degree murder because of his willingness to turn state's evidence. His reward was five years to life in the state penitentiary. Thank you, Chief Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, police cars of the largest cities and counties in the West are advertising Rio Grande cracked gasoline every day. When they go roaring past you with engines racing and sirens screaming, they are telling the world that Rio Grande cracked gasoline is the most powerful and speediest gasoline to answer emergency calls. In the cities of Oakland and many others in Northern California, in Los Angeles and numerous Southern California cities, in Arizona's largest county, Maricopa, the conditions under which police, fire, and emergency cars operate are entirely different. Yet all agree that Rio Grande Cracked is the best gasoline they can buy. The same gasoline is offered to you every day by Rio Grande dealers in your neighborhood. Drive in tomorrow and learn the difference. Learn also about Rio Grande's free gift plan, which enables you to make some boy or girl mighty happy with a membership in Rio Grande's junior police force. It costs you nothing to give a complete junior detective 14-piece outfit to any youngster you like. Ask the Rio Grande dealer. You'll also find Sinclair Motor Oil featured in Rio Grande stations. Sinclair Motor Oils are guaranteed by one of the world's largest lubricant manufacturers. You can't buy any purer oil for Sinclair de-waxes and de-jellies these oils to remove all impurities. That's why you can use a thinner oil when you specify a Sinclair and you get no oil drag. Your engine can speed up without danger for Sinclair Motor Oil is guaranteed to give never-failing lubrication from the second you touch the starter up to the top speed of your car. Very few brands can equal the performance of Sinclair Motor Oils and none can excel them. <laughs> 